So why do we do research with humans? Well, of course, lots of reasons. There's uh, clinical trials for, for drugs and pharmaceuticals. There's um, interviews with students and in schools and with uh, other populations, um, devices, medical devices, working with uh, people in other cultures, uh, and oral histories even. Um, the work with human subjects is, is about as vast as you can imagine. So really, there's only a few things that you have to worry about whether or not you're doing research with human subjects, and that is, one, is it research? And two, are they human subjects? Uh, as, you, as you'll see, with uh, research is defined in, in, uh, by the federal regulation as a systematic investigation uh, that includes research development, testing, and evaluation. And it's designed to develop or contribute for generalizable knowledge. Uh, likewise, human subjects is also defined by uh, regulation where it's living individuals about whom an investigator uh, is conducting some sort of research to obtain data about some sort of intervention or um, other kind of interaction or involves identifiable private information. So we uh, have in place an IRB, that stands for the Institutional Review Board. Um, that governing body at, at an institution such as UNM uh, serves to protect the rights and welfare of research subjects. Uh, it functions as a compliance committee and, it, and it's really focused um, on uh, the protection of human subjects involved in research. Now this committee, the IRB, uh, evaluates risk and benefit. Uh, and a lot of this has been developed historically uh, because of some behaviors in the past by researchers that required us to to put regulations in place, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about here. Now, the Nuremberg Code was developed after the trials that followed World War II in 1949, and there was basically, there was 10 uh, uh, points that came out of, of that. And as you can see here, it, it involves the voluntary consent of the human subjects. The experiment should have some benefit to society. Uh, the experiment should be based on, on animal studies. And this is one of the first times that actually animals uh, became a, a, a focal point of doing experimentation on before the other animals, before working on humans. Uh, experimentation should be conducted to avoid any pain or, or mental suffering or injury to the human participants. Um, another one is that no experiment should be conducted where there's any reasonable uh, indication of death or injury. The uh, degree of risk should not exceed uh, the uh, anticipated benefits of the study. And these last few include uh, proper preparations, good facilities, good training by uh, scientifically qualified people. And the, uh, an important part is that the participant can choose at any time to discontinue their uh, participation. Um, and also finally is that the scientist who is running the experiment should not be part of the experiment. The, the, the Tuskegee study uh, came out of uh, a study from the U.S. Public Health Service in, and it ran from 1932 to 1972. Um, its goal was to uh, look at uh, a natural progression of syphilis uh, from beginning to end, and, and they chose um, African-American males out of Alabama, Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, to run the experiment on. Now, uh, it went 40 years. The, the the participants were never told about the fact they could uh, get out of the study. They were never told that when penicillin became available in the early 1950s, that that would cure the syphilis and, and they would be free of the disease. Uh, and many participants died. It wasn't until it was revealed in a news story, and I believe it was in Rolling Stone magazine in 1972, that um, uncovered the study and uh, it was shut down. Another experiment that came out in 1971 uh, was uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment. And the hypothesis was uh, that, uh, by Dr. Zimbardo, uh, do circumstances drive immoral behavior? Uh, in this experiment, they had um, Stanford college students, um, all males, and they, se they separated them into uh, inmates and into prison guards and housed them in the basement of the psychology building. Well, pretty quickly, the, the whole experiment became um, cruel and abusive of the, of the prisoners. Uh, the 
investigator, uh, Zimbardo, did not stop the experiment because he himself was part of the experiment. He was actually the prison administrator. And it wasn't uh, until six days uh, after abuse and uh, some of the participants asked to get out of the experiment and basically were not allowed to, uh, there, there are some stories around that, um, that the research assistant stopped the experiment. And she told Dr. Zimbardo, look, this has gone too far. So what was supposed to have been a two-week investigation in the psychology of prison life um, had degraded in six days uh, to uh, a real abusive situation. Now, the question is, was there an IRB in place at the time? Would that IRB have been able to prevent the abuse and, and the permanent lifelong injury that some of these participants have continued to feel? Uh, would this experiment have gone forward? Probably not in its, in its current form. So uh, with uh, the Nuremberg Code and, and experiments like uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment, and especially the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, uh, uh, caused for uh, a group of people to get together and form a commission on the protection of human subjects in uh, research. What, what happened is after a, a number of years, uh, this committee came up with um, the guidelines for the protection of human subjects in research, and they uh, call it the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report has a number of guiding um, ethical principles, three of them, in fact. Uh, the first is respect for persons or autonomy. And this means that um, you, you don't use people as a means to an end, that uh, you have extra protection for people that have compri uh, compromised autonomy. Uh, individuals have a choice to, to participate or not participate. They have autonomy. Uh, a second principle is beneficence or do no harm. And um, what this is really is the risk and benefit. So do the risks of the research, are they justified by the potential benefits of, uh, to the individual or to society? And then the third is justice or share the burden. Uh, don't use populations out of convenience that there's a, a fair sharing of burdens and benefits of research. Um, so these are the three principles of uh, the Belmont Report that are, are followed today in, in our um, regulations for the, the uh, IRB. Um, the IRB is, is overseen by the OHRP, which is the um, Office for Human Research Protections uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and also the FDA oversees uh, use of devices and, and other things that are, that are tested by IRB. There's the 45 CFR 46. Go look it up. It's the actual federal regulation. It's the Title 45 Code of Federal Regulations, and it's the Part 46 that, that gives the protection to the human subjects. Now, there's some subparts to that, subparts B, C, and D, that are uh, relevant for vulnerable populations, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. The IRB, the Institutional Review Board itself, reviews as a full board once a month um, studies that are considered uh, greater than minimal risk. The uh, IRB also has an expedited process uh, where it doesn't go through full board review, but it does go through review by some of the board members for minimal risk sorts of studies. And then there's the third category of exempt, where um, it's still reviewed by board members, but it's, not, it's considered less than minimal risk. There, uh, sometimes you'll, you may submit a protocol to the IRB that is not human subject research. You may not have known that when you submitted it, but they can provide you that. Um, usually approvals are for one year. They can be for less, and uh, you need to renew your protocols before you continue your research. So no research on human subjects can be conducted unless you have an approved protocol by the IRB on campus. Now, one of the important aspects of human research protections is, is informed consent. Um, and this is that principle, the respect for persons or autonomy that, that we talked about from the Belmont Report. And what that means is that uh, for legally informed consent, the subject must understand the facts. Uh, they must appreciate the implications of their decision to participate. They must have the ability to decide and also have the ability to communicate their decision. Circumstances of consent uh, include providing a sufficient opportunity for a person to review the, the study plan and the consent form, 
there's no coercion or minim, minimizing coercion. The person can be in another room or they can take the consent form home and read through it. And that uh, there's no undue influence on, on looking at the consent form and deciding whether or not to consent. The mandatory elements include such things, and, and you know, a lot of this was in, in the Nuremberg Code, where you discuss what the uh, study was about, the purpose of the research, the qualifications of the researcher, the description of the risk, description of the benefit, uh, alternatives, how confidentiality and, uh, of your data are, are, is maintained. Uh, is, is there any compensation for participating uh, that you can leave the study at any time and it's voluntary? Another issue is privacy and confidentiality. And, and these days with Facebook and people knowing where everybody is from, um, where's my iPhone, et cetera, uh, I think the concept of privacy is, is maybe changing. However, confidentiality is about data and uh, disclose private information. And it's given, it's given to the investigator in a relationship of trust and it's not to be divulged to others and, and in ways that are not agreed upon in the consent. So that's a very important thing for the IRB to review and to uh, make sure the uh, investigator and the other people in the study understand is the rules of confidentiality. Uh, I mentioned vulnerable populations, subpart B, C, and D. Uh, subpart B is, is to cover pregnant women and, and fetuses, neonates. Subpart C covers prisoners. And then subpart D covers children, that uh, research that has to do with children. Uh, the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, must have a representative uh, of those groups on the board to review and approve protocols if they're uh, conducting those sorts of studies. So if there's prisoner research, then uh, there's a prisoner representative that has experience with prison populations and uh, protections on the board. Likewise with children, there's someone that can is, is familiar with protections of children used in research. In that case, when you use children, there's a consent form and there's also an assent form where the child understands that you're going to do this, right? Okay. <laughs> and mom agrees or dad agrees. Um, also, the HIPAA, the um, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, was put in place in the early 2000s for uh, protecting patients from insurance companies uh, uh, maybe getting a hold of their health information and using it perhaps unfairly. Well, HIPAA needs to be waived if you're involved in a, in a study that involves medical information. So you may be asked as a participant to read and, and waive your HIPAA rights. As an investigator, you'll need to um, uh, provide uh, participants the, the HIPAA waiver form, which is separate from a consent. So IRB is um, uh, on main campus is housed over on Sigma Chi Road. Um, protocols are handled all electronically. And I recommend that you contact staff over there uh, early and often. And if you have any questions, uh, they're very helpful. And they hold a number of workshops themselves that can answer more specific questions about your project. This module uh, continues with uh, uh, some information about publications and peer review. What uh, is important to know is what um, journal you want to publish in, what are the responsibilities of an author, um, how are your articles reviewed, and how is the information transmitted to the journal? Well, the first thing, you, one of the first things you should do is, is go pull up a journal that you want to submit a manuscript to. Um, for instance, if you want to submit to JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, it has an extensive uh, instructions to authors agreement, and it includes everything from um, who the author is, why they're the author, in other words, did they contribute to the intellectual property, did they collect the data, did they do the graphs, were they involved in statistics, and they'll want to know just about all those details. Moreover, there's a, a, a section in there about the conflicts of interest and what sort of conflicts you may have in, in the research and in the publication. And that what that means is, for instance, you um, um, have an investment in the chemical or the drug that you're testing, um, has that conflict been um, mediated? Do you have, has it been managed? Do you have a management plan in place? Um, and so that's, conflicts of interest are all about disclosure. And as long as you disclose your conflict and how it's managed and that it was managed properly, then you can usually continue on with, with your research and with the reporting of the research. 
But it's interesting that they'll, they'll ask this right at the at the end when you're trying to publish a paper. Um, also, you'll transfer your copyright. Uh, you own it, it, you, your thoughts and your words and your graphs and your figures and everything until you transfer that intellectual property via copyright to the journal. And at that point, it's not yours anymore. It belongs to the journal to market as they want. So as long as you remember that an author is the person who originates or, or gives existence to anything, uh, and with that comes a responsibility of, of what was created uh, in the sense of a journal article. And the, the purpose of authorship, as, as I'm sure you know, is to share those results in, in an honest and um, scholarly way. But also, authorship and publication is sort of the gold of, of research. Uh, paper, number of papers are counted, and they're, con and they're counted as part of career advancement and uh, even getting a job initially. And in the different uh, disciplines, whether it's humanities or computer science or natural sciences or medical sciences, there's all sorts of different um, standards for how authorship is uh, selected, whether you're, you're the first author, you're the corresponding author, the last author, they all have meaning uh, in different disciplines. Sometimes it's just alphabetical. If there's so many authors, it might be the easiest way to go. So in, in what order authorship, you uh, really need to decide that with your co-authors early on. And there's no hard and fast rule except that um, do it early on and uh, talk about it and talk about it frequently. I'm going to be first author in this paper. You be first author on the next paper. You know, I'll make sure that, that the, uh, all the references are checked and all the, all the data are correct. Um, and you be sure that the statistics are run right and the the analysis is, is displayed correctly, uh, something like that. And then you, you keep checking up on it. What I like to tell folks is that follow it up with an email. Remember we had that discussion about authorship uh, and I'm going to be first author. Can you second? Yeah, okay. All right. And do it off and check in with each other. There, that way there's no surprises. Sometimes there's surprises at the end and you don't want that. Um, there's also things uh, to watch out for, uh, such as self-plagiarism. Um, or even, even salami science, as they call it. What's salami science? Well, uh, it, there, there's usually a logical unit in which you publish a paper. It tells a story, and you get it out, and you get it done. What a lot of editors look for is our, our um, authors sometimes will just try and get a lot of publications out of a smallish project. And, and um, um, you know, work with your colleagues, work with your advisor, your mentor, uh, work with others to say, you know, this is the project. It looks like a nice, solid piece that we can publish. Let's go for it. And uh, usually uh, reviewers will will find uh, uh, papers that, that are maybe not quite ready for, for publication, which brings up the review process. Uh, it, not long ago, there was a shift. Previously, um, when you would send a manuscript to an editor, the editor would look at it and say, <clears throat> oh, this, this looks good. This will be fit in our journal. I'm going to send it out to two reviewers. Uh, this reviewer may have um, um, area expertise, and this reviewer is just a good general biologist that we've used for the journal. Uh, um, she knows well what, what fits in our journal, so we'll send it to her. Uh, and off it goes. So you're known as an author, but the reviewers are anonymous. And they'll, they'll look at their comment, they'll develop their comments, and they'll send them back to the editor in a couple weeks or maybe a month. And uh, with their comments, the editor will then uh, add in their comments and send them back to you as the author. You then take those comments, you decide whether you're going to accept them or address them or how you're going to do it. Um, and then you, you make the revisions, you send the revision back to the editor, and usually you're, you're, you'll, you'll get an acceptance from there on. That, that's a usual process. Uh, what, what the change has been is that now, uh, because of bias perhaps, or... Um, uh, uh, plagiarism of other people's ideas. Um, the process has moved where uh, both the reviewers are anonymous and the authors anonymous. So you'll submit your paper, take your name off, take your address off, take any any sort of uh, identifier um, out of the paper, and uh, the editor will look at that and then send it out for review again. Um, either way, it's important to have expertise. It's important to have timeliness. It's important not to have biases. Uh, that invade the whole review process. And if that's the case, then the reviewer should recuse or excuse themselves and um, uh, turn the paper back because of some potential conflict. 
is it ever fruitful to stop research because uh, you, you, you're running a lab experiment, you get a paper to review, you get an idea from that review material that could help your project. Now, uh, there, there is some advice that yes, if you do get ideas that would um, stop you from, from basically failing in your experiments, then you should stop. But you, you shouldn't incorporate what you get out of a re reviewed paper or reviewed comments into your research and continue on. The, the, the best way, the most ethical way, is to contact the editor and then through the editor contact the original author where you're reviewing the, the material and say, hey, I've read this paper of yours. You know, you've got some great ideas. Let's collaborate. Let's get together. I'm, have, I'm really having a hard time with this. Um, and what you said really, really helped me uh, grease the wheels on my experiments. Uh, and then also uh, um, another another issue that comes up is it okay for graduate students to review manuscripts? Uh, it it is just to cut to the quick. It is okay if you get uh, approval from the editor saying, I'll, you know, thanks for this paper to review. I'm going to you know, uh, discuss it in our lab, and then we'll put our review comments together and send it back to you. That could be actually a good learning experiment, uh, uh, learning tool for your students, but also. Um, you could get a, a better review in the long run. <clears throat> so, uh, and lastly, if you do take something from a paper and use it, uh, if someone feels that the work has been appropriated during peer review, uh, there, there may be a way for those authors to address those concerns uh, to the alleged offender. As, the, as a reviewer, you would be the alleged offender. Um, and simply going through the, the research misconduct process at the institution. An issue with data comes up often uh, about who owns research data. Uh, if you, you're a student, you're working in a lab, you, your uh, PI has a grant, and um, the grant is funding this project, you generate all these data, and it's yours, right? Well, no. The uh, grants are issued to the institution, so in this case, the University of New Mexico, and the, the PI is, is the steward of those data, and their security, and their, really their distribution. Uh, and so data books and lab books and all that belongs with UNM and the institution. Now, if you're going to go off to a new position and you would like to work on a project that you worked on previously, you can talk to your PI and say, um, I'd like to keep working on this. Can I get copies of data? Can I work on this more? Let's collaborate. That's a really good way to start out a professional relationship with your mentor other than, than stealing lab books or stealing data and, and thinking you're going to work on it on your own on the slide. Uh, there have been cases where people have been arrested, actually, for, for stealing lab books. Okay, and so in summary, um, the National Science Foundation data sharing policy is, is a very real good summary for what we've been talking about in this module, is that the NSF, the National Science Foundation, expects significant findings from research uh, and your activities that it supports to be promptly submitted for publication with an authorship that reflects the contributions of those involved. Uh, it expects investigators to share with others at no more than incremental cost and with a reasonable amount of time uh, data, samples, and other physical collections and supporting materials that were created uh, and were gathered in the course of the work. Uh, it also uh, encourages awardees to share software and to share inventions to make them useful and usable. Now, there's exceptions allowed for some human subjects in uh, data and, and uh, the confidentiality statements um, and the validity of results or the integrity of collections. So there are some exceptions, but um, in general, if you have federal funding, uh, you're encouraged to share it and make it available in a timely manner. Okay, in this module, I'd like to talk uh, for a few minutes about predatory publishing. This is something that, that uh, in the last 10 years, libraries that have been promoting open access publishing have kind of created a boom where journals, uh, instead of selling the hardcover subscription journals that get mailed to you once a month or every quarter. Um, journals are, are available online, open access. All you need is a computer and a website um, to really to access. So what's happened though is predatory publishers, those that unprofessionally exploit this open access model, uh, exploit it for their own profit. Uh, these public, public publishers use deception uh, to appear legitimate, and they entrap researchers and, and students and others uh, into submitting their work and then charging them, charging them a pretty good penny for uh, for a quick publication at that's uh, 
in their in their words, peer review. Uh, and you may have gotten spam emails and other sorts of uh, electronic communications from from some of these groups. Um, the Public Library of Science, the PLOS journals, typically charge uh, about twelve hundred to about three thousand dollars to publish a paper, um, with a discount if there's a researcher or you're you know affiliated with university. And the more, but the more papers that these journals publish, the more money they make. So greedy publishers set up shop online. The primary goal is to publish as much as possible. They'll hire young business managers that really have no background in science or research uh, that may or may not go through peer review. Usually they'll fore forego the peer review process while pre still presenting them as a peer review or scientific journal. So these counterfeit publications uh, use the same name as legitimate pop uh, publications, or at least very close names. Uh, and the number of possible predatory journals has increased by a huge amount, from 18 in 2011 to um, over 900 now, now in 2016. Um, and you can go to the University of Colorado Denver's uh, Australia Library, and, and Jeffrey Beal is managing a website there that, that documents the journals that are uh, considered predatory. So what do you do if you think you're subject to a predatory journal or word spinning or some other uh, uh, predatory behavior, I guess, uh, from, towards getting your papers published? I mean, you want to publish a paper. Again, like I said, it's, it's the gold standard. It's what we, we get hired and maintain our, our, uh, our profession on. It's also something that's very important for knowledge and generation of knowledge. So first off, know the journal you publish in. Talk to your colleagues about meetings and outlets and other sorts of, of ways that you know the society, the, usually the scientific society that's behind the journal. Um, watch sites such as Retraction Watch or um, the, uh, the Beale site of the University of Colorado for bogus journals. and, and and be familiar with that list. Report those journals uh, that seem less than legit. You, again, you probably get solicitations fairly frequently, once or twice a week, to publish your work. And then um, think about how this increase in these predatory journals and this behavior affects not just science, but just the generation and maintenance of knowledge. Um, it, it has a potential of, of causing some great damage. So. Be vigilant. Uh, be suspicious. If someone says, send me your paper, I would, we're going to publish it sight unseen. Just send me a check for $3,000. Um, chances are that's not something you want to be involved with. Um, I encourage you to stop by the Academic Integrity and Research Ethics Office anytime or give us a call. Check our website. Uh, if you have any questions about publications or peer review or any other aspects on the responsible conduct of research. And Keep doing it right. Thanks.